Scalp Scalp is a soft tissue covering the cranial vault. It extends from the supraorbital margin in the anterior region to the external occipital protuberance posteriorly. Laterally, it extends to the superior temporal line. The scalp has five distinct layers. Skin, which is the most superficial layer. Superficial fascia or the connective tissue containing the veins and the arteries. Aponeurosis present below the connective tissue. Loose connective tissue which is present below the aponeurosis. And the pericranium or the periosteum covering the cranial bone. The initial alphabet of these layers are S, C, A, L, P. That makes it easy to remember the layers. Skin is the thick and the outermost layer. It contains hair and sebaceous glands. Scalp is the most common site for sebaceous cyst formation. The connective tissue is also called as the fibrofatty tissue and it unites the skin to the underlying aponeurosis. This layer contains numerous arteries and veins and hence bleeds profusely in case of an injury. The epicranial aponeurosis. This is the thin layer and like a tendon. It unites the occipital and frontal bellies of the occipitofrontalis muscle and is attached laterally to the temporal fascia. Since the aponeurosis is tightly attached to the muscle, wounds of the scalp do not open wide. Loose areolar connective tissue. This is the subaponeurotic space and connects the aponeurosis to the pericranium. The emissary veins course through this layer and connect the extracranial veins to the intracranial venous sinuses. Periosteum. This layer is loosely attached to the underlying bone. It can be easily stripped off. However, it is firmly attached to the pericranium at the suture lining. Muscles of the scalp. The occipitofrontalis muscle is the chief muscle of the skull. It has a frontal belly and an occipital belly that are connected by epicranial aponeurosis. Contraction of the frontal belly raises the eyebrows. Contraction of the occipitofrontalis muscle leads to forward and backward movement of the first three layers of scalp. The frontal belly of the occipitofrontalis muscle arises from the skin of the forehead and mingles with the orbicularis oris muscle. It inserts onto the epicranial aponeurosis. It is wide and connected partially at the midline. The occipital belly of the occipitofrontalis muscle arises from the highest nuchal line of the occipital bone and inserts onto the epicranial aponeurosis anteriorly. These are small and separate muscles. Arterial supply of scalp. The scalp has a rich supply by the branches of the external carotid artery and the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery arises from the common carotid artery and gives off the supraorbital and the supratrochlear branches. The external carotid artery gives off the occipital artery, posterior auricular artery and the superficial temporal artery. So the scalp receives its blood supply from these five vessels and they anastomose with each other to provide profuse blood supply to the scalp. Now supply of the scalp. In front of the auricle, the scalp receives nerve supply from the supratrochlear, supraorbital, zygomaticotemporal and the auriculotemporal nerve. These are derived from the trigeminal nerve. Behind the auricle, the scalp receives nerve supply from the greater auricular nerve, lesser occipital nerve, greater occipital nerve and the third occipital nerve. Motor supply to the scalp is for the occipitofrontalis muscle. The frontal bellies are supplied by the temporal branch of the facial nerve, while the occipital bellies are supplied by the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. Venous drainage of the scalp. The veins of the scalp accompany the arteries. The supratrochlear and the supraorbital veins join the angular vein to form the facial vein. The superficial temporal vein joins the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein. The retromandibular vein divides into anterior and the posterior divisions. The anterior division joins the facial vein to form the common facial vein which drains into the internal jugular vein. Posterior division of the retromandibular vein joins the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein. 
that drains into the subclavian vein. Emissary veins. They connect the veins outside the cranium to the intracranial dural venous sinuses. There are two emissary veins on each side of the scalp. The parietal emissary vein, they pass through the parietal foramen to enter the superior sagittal sinus. The mastoid emissary vein, they pass through the mastoid foramen to reach the sigmoid sinus. The emissary veins can carry infection from the outer level of scalp to the intracranial dural venous sinuses. Diploic veins. These are thin walled valveless veins. They are present in the soft spongy cancellous bone between the inner and the outer tables of the skull and occupies the channels in the diplo. They drain blood from the diplo into the intracranial dural venous sinuses. There are four diploic veins in the spongy cranial bone. The frontal, anterior temporal, posterior temporal and the occipital diploic veins. Lymphatic drainage of the scalp. The anterior part of the scalp drains into the parotid lymph nodes or the preauricular lymph nodes. The posterior part of the scalp drains into the mastoid and the occipital lymph nodes which are also called as the posterior auricular lymph nodes. Clinical importance of the scalp. Sebaceous cyst formation. The skin of the scalp contains numerous sebaceous glands. Presence of these glands make the scalp most common site for sebaceous cyst formation. The ducts of the sebaceous glands are more prone to infections and damage by combs. This can lead to formation of the sebaceous cyst. The loose areolar connective tissue is considered as a dangerous area of scalp. This is because the emissary veins can carry infection from the outer layers to the intracranial dural venous sinuses. This can lead to formation of venous sinus thrombosis which is fatal. Or if the infection spreads to the bone, it can lead to osteomyelitis. The loose areolar connective tissue is freely mobile over the underlying bone. And in case of injury, blood or pus can get collected in this layer which can spread for long distance over the scalp. Scalp injuries can lead to black eye. This can occur due to the subcutaneous extravasation of blood into the eyelids. Blunt trauma to the scalp can lead to pus or blood accumulation in the loose areolar connective tissue and may cause swelling of the scalp. Since the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle does not have a bony attachment anteriorly, the blood moves forward into the eyelids leading to hematoma formation. This leads to black discoloration of skin around the eye and leads to black eye. Bleeding from the scalp The scalp has an abundant blood supply and injury to the scalp can lead to profuse bleeding. This can be difficult to stop as the arteries are attached to the fibrous fascia that does not allow the retraction or contraction of the arteries to arrest bleeding. Such condition can be managed by pressure application against the bone to control bleeding. In case of life-threatening hemorrhage of the scalp, first aid measure should be followed. This involves tying a piece of cloth or sting above the ears and eyebrows which acts like a tourniquet. Severe lacerations of the scalp during vehicle accident leads to tearing and avulsion of portions of the scalp. These portions should be sutured in position as they heal well due to the rich blood supply. Fracture of cranial vault can occur in case of injury in children. This leads to intracranial hemorrhage and blood collection in the loose areolar connective tissue. However, there are no signs of cerebral compression until the fourth layer of the loose areolar connective tissue is filled with blood. Hence, the fourth layer is called as a safety layer. If cerebrospinal fluid gets collected in the fourth layer, the condition is called as cephalohydrocele. Cephalhematoma this refers to the collection of blood between the pericranium and the bone. Cephalhematoma is restricted to the particular bone as the periosteum is firmly attached at the sutures and prevents spread to the adjacent bones. Significance of the aponeurosis The aponeurosis remains under tension due to the pull of the occipitofrontalis muscle. 
This is the reason why scalp wound do not gape or open unless the epigranial aponeurosis is split. Deep wounds that split the epigranial aponeurosis should be sutured to avoid gaping. So to summarize, scalp is a soft tissue covering the vault. Anatomically, it has five layers, the skin, superficial fascia, aponeurosis, loose areola connective tissue, and pericranium. Scalp derives its nerve supply from the branches of the facial nerve. Blood supply is through the supratrochlear, supraorbital, superficial temporal, occipital, and posterior auricular arteries. The venous drainage occurs into the internal and external jugular vein. Lymphatic drainage takes place in the parotid, mastoid and occipital lymph nodes. The scalp has a clinical importance, especially in case of scalp injuries, sebaceous cysts and scalp infections. You can find the link to MCQs for the topic in the description of the video. Thank you for watching the video. We hope you liked it. And if you did, please subscribe to the channel for more videos and hit the notification bell for update on new videos. So see you in the next video, till then stay healthy and have an amazing week.